So now, just before starting, I'm going to briefly introduce Joshua Benjo, although probably there's no need, but I'll anyway go ahead. So Joshua Benjo is a professor at the Department of Computer Science and Operations Research at the University of Montreal and scientific director of the Montreal Institute of Learning Algorithms, MILA. He received his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering, his master's in computer science, and his PhD in computer science from McGill University. He was a postdoc then fellow at MIT. He has received many awards, probably some of the most notably, named an officer of the Order of Canada, nominated fellow of the Royal Academy of the Royal Society of Canada, and received the Marie Victorian Quebec Prize. Finally, but not least, he won in 2018 the Turing Award for his work on deep learning, for which he's considered one of the fathers of AI, of modern AI and deep learning. Maybe many of you have read this book, but also something nice about it is that it's called Deep Learning Book, and it's freely accessible for everyone in the internet. Finally, but probably most importantly, he's a great advocate of using AI to mitigate climate change, to, st to stop talk on AI arms race, and to make technology more accessible to developing countries such as Mexico and Latin America. So please, let's welcome him here. Thank you for the kind words. Uh, these are the people at Mila. Um, so uh, today my presentation will be a bit more technical than yesterday. Um, Feel free to actually uh, ask questions in the middle if you want. Um, I'll be happy to try to answer. Okay, so the, the, the core um, theme of this presentation is the agent learning perspective, usually called reinforcement learning, but I, I like to really make the focus here on the notion of actions and uh, how that changes perspectives in terms of um, uh, deep learning, which is the thing I care about, in particular learning representations. Um, and one thing that really uh, matters when you start thinking about the agent perspective, unlike the usual um, IID machine learning approach, is that we have to start thinking about the fact that when you act in the world or there may be other agents acting in the world, the uh, data that the, the learner is seeing is, is not following always the same distribution. It's non-stationary. So these changes in distribution become something important. And of course, I think they're also important in practical applications, but, but I think uh, they, there's a lot of interesting uh, fundamental issues that we have to revisit in learning theory and algorithms to uh, handle properly this uh, scenario. Um, and uh, one aspect that uh, I particularly care about is how it becomes uh, potentially easier but also different for an agent which observes uh, its environments and can act in it to build a, an internal model of it, to really understand it in a way that's less superficial than what we currently have. Okay, so I showed this slide already yesterday, so just as a reminder that um, um, one of the aspects that uh, I want to talk about today is how we um, extend the work that we've done in deep learning for learning representations from the system one tasks where we can do good things at the level of perception, unconscious types of, um, of computations, into the conscious type, which is more algorithmic, uh, including things like reasoning and planning, that is um, uh, not just important in, in RL, but also when you want to do uh, dialogues, for example, natural language understanding and things like this. Uh, sorry. Okay, so here I have um, a little thought experiment which um, I want to introduce in order to uh, motivate the idea that it's not enough to do natural language understanding by training our learner on texts. 
which is right now what most researchers working on natural language do. We have these huge data sets, uh, corpora of um, uh, text and uh, say translated text or um, um, all kinds of uh, NLP tasks where it's just basically we would like the learner to understand what the text means, but we only feed it with texts or sometimes with a few semantic or, or grammatical labels. But I don't think that's sufficient. And so here's a thought experiment to try to um, illustrate why I think so. Imagine you go to another planet and you observe the aliens there, maybe you know, from your spaceship, but you can catch the bits that they're exchanging. And you'd like to understand what they mean, right? In a way, it's just a transposition of what we're doing when we do natural language understanding and language modeling and so on. Um, but now, the situation on this planet is going to be slightly different from on, on this planet. Um, like on Earth, there's going to be a price for bandwidth. So in other words, I, I don't want to send too many bits to my uh, correspondent. But um, unlike on Earth, I, uh, these aliens are able to uh, send bits through a noise-free channel. Whereas, you know, we use speech, we've evolved to use speech, and uh, speech goes through a, a noisy channel, so there's a lot of redundancy in speech. And you can find that redundancy in natural languages as well, if you just take the text. So, if you are one of these aliens, and you know, you have evolved a way to communicate efficiently, you want to take advantage of the fact that um, you can get perfect, I mean, you can get noise-free channel to comp to uh, optimize your use of bandwidth, and so you're going to compress your message before you send it. Right? So these aliens would compress um, their message. And you know what happens when you compress something? When you compress a file? You get really good compression, gives you random bits. Right? Try to make sense of a, a zipped file by looking at the bits. Right? It's very hard. So if, you were, if we were to do like language modeling on the zipped files, right? try it. You'll see. It doesn't really work because it, it looks like they are random. So if we were to apply the techniques that we currently apply to analyze texts on this planet, it just wouldn't work. OK, so what's missing? Um, well, unfortunately, uh, the only way around on this planet, and I think on our planet as well, is we actually have to make extra effort to understand what those bits mean. And uh, for that, we're going to have to understand the context of these speakers, these aliens. We have to, have to look at what they're doing, trying to figure out their intentions, and build a model of um, their world, how it works, and uh, what they do, and why they do it, and so on, which is going to be hard, much harder than just training a neural net on the bits that they're producing. All right. Um, so I think we have to do the same thing here. In other words, if we want to do really good language understanding beyond um, just you know incremental progress that will happen in, in the next few years, we, we have to solve AI, right? We have to build systems that understand their environment, understand our world. OK, so um, one reason why I think we also have to do that is uh, I think something I mentioned yesterday, which is uh, the current approaches, they'll get better, but they continue, even if we train them on huge quantities of data, more than any human has ever seen in their lifetime, they, they make sometimes really stupid mistakes, which reveal that they have learned a lot of, lots of interesting patterns and some structure, um, which could be very useful in, in, in many applications, but they don't have, um, enough of a, of a deep understanding of how things work in, in the world. And so they remain vulnerable to uh, changes in distribution. Whereas humans seem to be able to handle these things much more uh, gracefully. But we need to understand how humans do it. And there may be a number of factors, uh, some of which we don't yet understand. But one element that I'll be telling you about today is I think humans um, very quickly understand causal relationships. So 
four-year-olds clearly understand causality, and it may start as early as two-year-olds. Uh, there's a number of experiments that have been done uh, to try to evaluate that. So, um, so why, what, you know, what's, what's the thing with causality? Um, as, as Pearl has been saying uh, a lot, uh, when you consider um, um, causality, you're bringing more information than what you get just in the joint distribution between random variables. Um, and in fact, you can easily come up with cases where um, purely observing the joint distribution still doesn't tell you um, what variables is cause and what variables effect, for example. So how could children figure it out if just observing the world is not sufficient? Well, it turns out that if you consider how the world changes, often because the agent or some other agent does something in it, you can acquire information about cause and effect. Like if I, if I push something, I can see that it is my action that has created the change in the world and maybe there's a chain of, of uh, effects that I can observe and understand. And of course, if you're an agent, it's very important to know that. So uh, I use this example of umbrellas and, and weather. Maybe it's not the best uh, uh, example, but um, you know, rain can cause people to open their umbrella, but it, opening your umbrella doesn't cause the rain. The joint distribution is the joint distribution, and it looks like these things are very strongly correlated. But uh, if you are an agent and you're trying to make rain happen, it's not going to work to open your umbrella. And that's important to know for an agent. Right. Um, so this is a, a, another topic that I'll talk about today, which is related to understanding how the world works. So there's causality. But there's another thing. The, th the techniques that we currently have to model joint distributions, I don't think are a good reflection of how humans do it. So the way that I have the impression that I can um, uh, project myself into the future to understand how my actions are going to result in some changes in the world does not involve something like running in my head a movie of all the things that could happen in the world uh, at full resolution. Okay, That is not what humans do. Um, right now, our unsupervised learning methods and, and deep generative models allow us to do things like synthesize images of faces or images of houses or whatever. Um, so it's all happening in the data space, in pixel space, typically. And this is great, and we can find lots of useful applications for this, but I don't think that's the way that humans um, use their imagination to uh, project themselves into the future or try to find explanations about the past. Instead, I believe that the way we do it is we, we use more abstract representations, higher levels of representations, not, not the pixel level, and we learn how the world can change as a consequence of you know, its dynamics or the effect of agents um, by modeling those, those changes in that higher level space. So um, one of the recent work we've been uh, doing is um, using uh, new techniques uh, based on, on GANs to estimate mutual information in order to learn to map um, raw data into a latent space such that, for example, two consecutive frames in latent space would be highly informative of each other without having to do just maximum likelihood to predict one thing given the other in order to learn the encoder. Otherwise, there is a little um, um, problem, which is uh, you can make the latent, you can make the predictions very good in the latent space by making the encoder output constants, right? So if my, if my uh, abstract representation is just constants, it's very, very easy to predict the future in that space. So the objective function of just predicting things in, in the latent space is not good. 
but maximizing mutual information actually is a good replacement. So this is a thing we've been working on, and there are several papers around that theme. Um, yeah, uh, let's see. Right. Um, now, in addition to doing all this um, projection about how the future could be in latent space, there's another aspect which I think is really important if we want to take inspiration from human cognition, which is what I want to do. And it's the fact that when, when I project myself into the future, I'm, as I said, I'm not uh, seeing a full movie of uh, unrolling the state of the world in the future, even the latent state. I'm only seeing a few aspects of the world which matter for my thoughts, for my um, planning. Right, so um, this is not something we've been doing in machine learning. Like typically, uh, we think of it, um, say, as uh, learning the probability of the future state or the future latent state, given the past, um, or given the past and some actions. But that's maybe too difficult, and doesn't feel like how humans do it. So what we need are tools to be able to um, uh, produce a sequence of uh, potential future events which focus on a few aspects of the world at a time. And I, I call this uh, line of work the consciousness prior because um, when we are conscious of something, I think it's this line, um, we're focusing on attention, our attention on a few aspects of the world. Right? We're not uh, having in mind, uh, at least consciously, the full state of the things uh, that are available to our perception. We're just going for um, maybe a handful of things that we're concentrating on right now, and then maybe one second later, it's a different set of things as our thoughts move forward. So this is user attention, and maybe we can use the progress we've made in attention mechanisms in the last few years to do something like this too. So in, to implement this particular aspect of consciousness that has to do with our ability to focus on a few things at a time in order to form a plan or something like this. So in this paper that I put out two years ago, which is like a proposal for um, exploring these ideas, um, what I have suggested is instead of thinking of just one high level of representation, we're going to have two types of uh, objects at this high level. We're going to have the regular uh, state, which is, contains all of the information that um, we could potentially be conscious of. So all of the high level variables would be represented there. Um, and that's what I call the unconscious state H here. Um, and we learn this encoder, which maybe is recurrent, that maps our perceptions to this uh, representation that captures all of the high-level variables, potentially with their uncertainty, because usually there is missing information. Um, and then on top of that, there is the conscious state, which is going to be a very, very small thing. Maybe a few, uh, like, what you have in short-term memory, right? So you know you can remember like five, six, seven things at a time. So these are the things that you're currently conscious of or are very close to um, that have been brought from that large unconscious state into your consciousness. And at each time step, you're using attention to select what will go next. Um, and you can use that conscious state to do things like projecting yourself into the future for planning a path or a decision or avoiding problems, all kinds of things that we do um, consciously. All right, which basically are in the realm of reasoning, but the way humans do it is, I think, different from what classical AI with logic was doing it, because we don't explore so many branches, and it's also different from um, the kind of uh, um, full state transition operator that we, we tend to look at in, uh, for example, in model-based RL. So, so the paper was called Consciousness Prior because 
the way to think about this uh, structure in probabilistic sense is that it's making a statement about the joint distribution between those high-level variables. Um, so remember I'm saying that we are mapping the observations, which may be a stream of observations, into this very high-dimensional um, unconscious state. And um, what I'm now claiming is we're using this conscious stuff to capture the joint distribution between all of these variables through very small nuggets of uh, knowledge, which you can think of rules, in, if you think in classical AI and, and so on. Um, or you can think in terms of graphical models um, as the joint distribution between all these high-level variables is a, a product of potential functions so these are functions of a few variables at a time. So each of these functions, this is a scalar, and this VSK here means uh, we have a small clique, a small group of variables which interact together to, to contribute to the, the potential, to the total um, uh, probability function, right? So um, there's already a lot of work in graphical models that uses this kind of formalism, which is called a factor graph. And the particular way to think about the consciousness as a prior is simply to say that the corresponding joint distribution uh, is a very sparse factor graph. In other words, these uh, potential functions, these, uh, these strong dependencies between variables are uh, involving very few variables at a time. Basically just enough that can fit into your consciousness bottleneck. Um, and I think there's something to this assumption which we can all experience. Um, when I make a statement like, if I drop the ball, it will fall on the ground, it's just a few words. It, it talks only about a few concepts. And you can think of, you know, maybe there's like a potential function which we can instantiate to uh, express this knowledge. And what's particular about it, in addition to the fact that it involves very few variables, is that it, uh, it, it can make very strong statements from a probabilistic perspective. In other words, this sentence is true with very high probability, right? Um, and this is unusual. Like, you don't get this usually. If I, if I were to make um, statements about pixels at the level of pixels, I would be very hard-pressed to come up with... Um, a statement that I could make that involves only five pixels and could make a probability guess about one of them given the other four where the probability would be very certain, like either close to zero or close to one, right? So these are strong probabilistic statements. They're like constraints, they're like rules, right? Um, so, so that's the idea of the conscious prior and it's called a prior because um, we, we can assume a structure like this and we're gonna encourage solutions that have this sparsity. And what I believe is, it's gonna help us learn um, more appropriate high-level representations. Because right, where we started from is, we want to discover from the world the right variables. And not all variables have this property that their joint distribution can be expressed as a sparse factor graph. So by imposing that prior, we're encouraging our solutions to have this, uh, um, this, uh, this assumption built in. Oh. Um, yeah. Um, let's see, how am I doing with time? So, the introduction of action that I started talking about and, and, and um, and causality is also connected to another notion that people in RL have been thinking about, which is the notion of controllability. Um, and I think we can use these notions to help us also put more pressure on these high-level variables. So a lot of the high-level variables that we communicate with language, like names of things and attributes of things, like say, I have you know, a concept for this pointer, and I also have a concept for the position of this pointer. And these are non-trivial functions of the pixels, right? That somehow my brain is computing. 
And, and um, there's something interesting about many of these variables is that I can control those variables. I can change them. I can come up with a policy, with a sequence of actions, which can selectively perturb the position of this object. And, well, more generally, there are agents in the world that can do these things. And if, if no agent can do it, we usually imagine that an agent can do it. Like, you know, people used to think that uh, the sun was like a, a, a living being that, that could move itself, right? Um, because it fits the prior that the, the things that change are changed because an agent is controlling them. Um, so this is another thing we can use because um, we can now say the variables that we want to put in there uh, should have a high mutual information with the policies that an agent can um, build uh, that have a, as an effect to change those variables. There's like uh, a, a ideally a one-to-one -one mapping between policies, like what I choose to do, my intentions, and the effects that I have in the world. If I had a pure one-to-one -one mapping, I would have a total control on everything in the world, right? And so it's both a way, this, this connection is both a way to learn good representations of the state of, of the world uh, and to learn good policies because we want policies that can allow us to do anything we want, right? So, so this is, I think, an important concept um, moving forward. And, and we started working on this a couple of years ago, and uh, there are several papers along that line of work. All right, so let me go back to this issue of changes in distribution. Um, as you probably know, the, 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 the classical learning theory you would learn if you were to take a machine learning class 101 is one which assumes that all the examples are coming to the learner independently and from the same distribution. And we have a lot of nice theory that when you are in this setting tells us that you will be able to generalize it so long as your learner is not too, too powerful, right? Um, and that's great. But in the real world, this assumption of IID data does not hold. The world keeps changing. So how do we deal with that? I don't think we have the right tools yet in machine learning, although there is some work, for example, in causality. Uh, and in meta-learning and transfer learning, people are starting to think about these questions. But there's a lot more that needs to be done. Right. Um, so connected to this, the way that I'm thinking about it is, well, if I want to be able to say something about generalization to a different distribution, I'm going to have to make assumptions about it, right? Otherwise... Well, what can I say? I mean, if, if I suddenly wake up in a totally different world where nothing that I know continues to be true, uh, then, well, it's not going to be very good for me. I won't be able to, um, to act in the world and, and be successful. All right, so what could we assume that's reasonable about those changes in distribution? And what I'm claiming is that in the world of agents, um, we could assume that the changes correspond to small changes that are localized. So when I move this pointer, I'm, I'm making a small change in the world that's very, very localized. And it's localized in space and in time because, you know, I'm physically in this one place in this one time and it's hard for me to change everything in the world from, you know, just my thoughts. But I can change my, you know, my arms around, move my arms around, move some things around, and so on. And it's true for many agents. So it's a good approximation of uh, what kinds of changes are happening in the world in, in terms of um, the, the, the distribution of things. And it's connected to a, um, an idea um, that has really impressed me a lot coming, uh, that I read in the book of uh, Peters, Jensing, and, and Shropkoff about causality. Um, the idea of independent mechanisms, which essentially says that the world we observe is the result of the combination of independent mechanisms. So light goes through different media and then it comes back to me. And each of these um, uh, intermediate steps, you can think of computations, but those computations are independent of each other. What does it mean that they're independent? Not in a statistical sense, in a usual sense, 
but in the sense that knowing about, um, say, one of these mechanisms doesn't teach you about another one. And that, you know, if one of them changes, then the others don't need to change, so they're not linked by some hidden secret thing. Under the right model of the world, right, uh, like the laws of physics, the, the way that physicists understand the world, this is very reasonable. Um, and, um, and so combining these two things, I think uh, we have a path towards uh, doing a better job at understanding um, how we can generalize in a world that changes under these kinds of assumptions. So, um, so the idea is if I represent my knowledge about the world as a composition of little pieces of knowledge, like the rules I was talking about before, in the right space, um, if I, if I choose the right representation that corresponds to these independent mechanisms and corresponds to this assumption of small local changes when there is an intervention, uh, I'm going to be very lucky because uh, the change is going to be localized and going to uh, uh, affect only a few variables or a few parameters that would need to be inferred or, or adapted uh, to take into account that change. So, so that's actually connected to another problem with deep learning and maybe machine learning often, but, but especially deep learning, which is the problem of what's called systematic generalization. It's, it also has to do with generalization outside of the training distribution, and it has to do with how the, the knowledge we've acquired through learning can be recombined in new ways that have never been seen in the training data and that has zero probability under the training data, and that we could still generalize to these new ways. And humans do that all the time. And especially when they, they reason, when they use system two, they do that all the time. And current neural nets usually fail, and there are several papers from my colleagues like Aaron Corville have been looking at the failures of current um, approaches. I mean, it's not a total failure, but, but, the, but really there's a big drop in performance when you, when you um, uh, do these kinds of um, changes. Okay, so, so maybe if we can entice a learner to find the right representation of knowledge into small reusable pieces, we'll also be in a good position to deal with these uh, changes in distribution if our assumptions uh, are good. So, so, so this is what we've started to do. Um, um, and as an illustration of this, we've studied a really, really simple system, the, pro the simplest possible system you could imagine, one in which you only have two random variables, A and B, and you're trying to learn the joint distribution of A and B, right? This looks like a really, really toy, but trust me, science often starts by really, really simple problems that we try to understand fully. And even that is not so easy to completely understand. Um, so, so if you're trying to represent that joint distribution, you can do it in many ways. In particular, you can uh, factor the joint into the product of one marginal and, and the uh, con and, and appropriate conditional or the other way, way around. But if you have the wrong factorization, so you can think of, you know, now my modules are the, the marginal of B and the conditional of A given B. Um, but maybe the right way to divide the joint is the other way around in the sense that a is the cause and B is the effect. In that case, you would like to, to, uh, to use the other factorization. So why is that? Um, because if somebody comes and changes the cause, A, it's going to change the marginal, P of A, um, but it's not going to change P of B given A. So why is that interesting? Because um, if, I, if I'm going to have to adapt to that change, to, to recover from that change, uh, and I only have to modify a few parameters, like those that control the marginal of A, and I don't have to modify all the other parameters, like P of B given A, then I'm, I'm, I'm in good business. Like, I can learn quickly from very few examples. Whereas if I have the wrong modularization, um, the change in P of A here would percolate into both uh, this marginal P of B and this conditional P of A given B, and so I would have to adapt all of my modules. So if you have the wrong modularization, which I think is what we have right now with typical neural nets, uh, where there's often no modularization or, no, or not one that is learned appropriately, um, when there's a change in distribution because of continual learning, transfer learning, or whatever, 
all the parameters want to be part of the change to adapt. And, and that means you need a lot of data to adapt to that change. So, so you get things like poor transfer, catastrophic forgetting, and all that. Um, yeah, let me skip this. Um, so so we're, we're going to go back to this picture. And now think about it in terms of um, um, what I was saying, that, well, if we had the right decomposition and the right factorization and so on and the right set of variables, then we would get fast adaptation to interventions. Can we turn this around into an objective function that tells us how to optimize our choice of variables, our choice of graph? That's what we've tried to do. Um, whoops. So oh, I think we're missing some colors, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, so this is, this is a, one part of a set of experiments where we try to validate these ideas. And, and uh, so this graph only shows that if you had the right factorization, then the likelihood would grow up quickly when you move to a new distribution. If you have the wrong factorization, it takes a lot more time. Eventually, asymptotically, the two will converge to the same thing. But so what matters here is the signal about the advantage of having the right representations and so on will be seen early on when the system is struggling to adapt. This is where there's most information so in other words, where it's hard to generalize is well, there's the more, most information about what is the right way of decomposing your knowledge. Um, so we wrote this paper, um, a meta transfer objective for learning to disentangle causal mechanisms to, to uh, explore these ideas. Um, and, um, and, and we're able to show that practically it works on, on, on these very simple distributions. And we have another one where we extend this to a larger sets of variables. Um, now, there's an issue here, which is the objective function that I've defined here is how fast you adapt to a change in distribution. That's like a weird objective function, right? It's not the usual like maximum likelihood or things like this. And it fits into the more general scenario of meta-learning. So what is meta-learning? Meta-learning is basically that we have two levels of learning. Right? Learning to learn. This is, I wrote a paper in 91 about learning to learn a synaptic rule. And when you have two levels of learning where there's an inner learning loop and an outer learning loop, um, where the outer learning loop needs to take into account what happens in the inner learning loop. So ideally, you'd like to backprop through what's going on in the inner learning loop to get a gradient on how to change the parameters that control the outer learning loop. So we already do that when we do hyperparameter selection, right? So when you choose um, uh, the size of your model and, 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 and learning rates and, and filter sizes and all these things, you're choosing the outer loop parameters. So there's like, you try many different uh, choices of these parameters. It's learning. It's, I mean, it's usually done in a very dumb way, but it's really learning. Uh, but nowadays we can do more powerful things where the outer loop is not just a few parameters but might be like a whole encoder or a whole neural net. Um, and um, yeah, so that's the idea. You can formalize it in terms of uh, like inner approximate minimization and then an outer one which uses the result of uh, the inner one as you know, some of its arguments. And um, that's, that's basically what meta-learning is. And so what's cool about it um, is that you can use meta-learning for many interesting things. In particular, you can lose meta, use meta-learning for learning how to generalize better. That's how we use hyperparameters, right? We, we check how well they work on the uh, validation set, right? So actually, we're optimizing for generalization. But we can do even better than optimizing for generalization. We can optimize for transfer, right? So we can optimize for how fast we learn on a new distribution. This is something cool because it gives a tool to deal with this problem of changes in distribution that I was telling you about, right? So I said learning theory doesn't give us any um, guarantees that when the distribution changes, we're going to generalize. But what if we train our system so that when the distribution changes, it performs well, it learns quickly, right? That's what meta-learning allows us to do. So this outer loop is a way to now do learning theory on a different plane, which is one where each example at the outer loop level is not like a, an image, but each example is 
a whole inner loop is a whole like scenario, like a trajectory in RL or uh, a sequence of five examples of a new distribution. So we call those meta examples. And uh, often we think of these meta examples as coming from a distribution over distributions, right? So we're going to have many tasks, for example, and we have a distribution over tasks. All right. So I think um, I'm going to stop here. Um, maybe I'll say a few words about how I see this uh, moving forward um, and summarize a bit of the things that I've, I've been saying. So uh, some of the things we're trying to do in my group is um, train agents that can interact with their environment, build a world model which captures causal effects so that they can quickly adapt to changes in the world and generalize out of distribution. And one thing I didn't talk a lot about, but uh, I mentioned controllability, is connected to how the learner can actively decide where to go in order to acquire more information. Uh, so that's exploration, but it's not like random exploration, like is typically the case in RL, but something that's more directed towards acquiring knowledge. And, and finally, I think that uh, making progress on these things, learning the right variables at the high level, uh, is starting to give us the tools to think about how neural nets can do planning um, of a form that is different from the things that happened in the past, but I think will be necessary to reach, reach the, bridge the gap to a human level AI. Um, I have a few more slides, and um, um, it's a different subject. So, as a researcher in this field, I feel like I can't just do my research without ignoring the fact that the work we're doing is having an impact in the world and will have even more of an impact in the future. And um, so I think it makes sense for uh, us who are building this future to talk to people who are working in society, who are academics or politicians or media, uh, and the public to, to discuss together um, what are the things that are acceptable on how AI is going to be used and what are the things that are not acceptable. Some of the things that I'm concerned about include how machine learning could be used to control population, so the big brother scenario, because you know we can have cameras all over the place that watch you. Um, it includes things like uh, lethal autonomous weapons, killer robots, that can really threaten the um, security of uh, uh, people in many countries. Um, it could also be used to control populations. Um, there are lots of issues, I think, that governments will have to think about, and many years in advance, about how those technologies might change a job market in a way that could create a lot of misery. So think about all the work that is, in, is being done in factories right now um, by low-skilled people and might be replaced by robots in 10 years from now. How do we deal with that socially, right? Where are we going to get the wealth to make sure that we can avoid the misery that may, um, at least in a transition, happen because of all these changes? Um, another important topic, I think, uh, in the last couple of years has been more obvious, is how machine learning um, is being used and will be used even more in the future to manipulate people. And the first place where this is happening is uh, advertising and social media, as we've seen in uh, political campaigns where political advertising uh, take, can take advantage of, of machine learning to have an undue influence on democracy and then and endangering democracy. Um, there was discussion already yesterday about uh, social biases and discrimination, I think another important topic. And, um, and there's a more general fear that if we don't collectively change to some extent the rules of the game, uh, we might go into a world with even more inequality between people, between countries, and between companies. Because AI can become very, very powerful. And of course, if you have power, then you tend to use it to acquire even more power. And that's not good. That's not good for democracy. That's not good for most people feeling um, good about themselves. and, and um, yeah, so I guess uh, uh, I'm going to stop here. Thanks.
so, so I, took, I took a bit more time because Jorge said, you can eat in my time uh, up to 20 minutes. And now we have time so, from, for questions. Yeah, yeah, we have enough time for questions. So uh, can people raise their hands? There's people there with microphones. Or... Um, thank you very much for your talk. And my question is about the use uh, of the term consciousness in your talk. Yes. Because it seems to me that your distinction is much closer uh, to the old, old traditional AI uh, divide between the sub-symbolic and the symbolic. So in a sense, uh, what I thought, I mean, for, I have understood is that your concern is really to bring the sub-symbolic into the symbolic in order that things are more transparent somehow with all the benefits that it has. But my question is really, I mean, in the old distinction between uh, whether machines can actually be conscious, and I'm thinking of Searle's papers on the yes. uh, Chinese room and the possibility that machines really understand and really be conscious and really be intentional and all yeah, that. Yeah. So, uh, are you implying that somehow uh, you reach that level of consciousness, you and consciousness, or do you just use consciousness as a kind of synonymous of declarative or symbolic level? And um, I mean, and well, all right. And Thanks. also, the other is would be would you one thing at a time, right? Okay. <laughs> so, um, so thanks for asking the questions about consciousness because it's it's high time that scientists start to study this question in like the scientific way and try to dissect this into things that we can understand computationally. And there are different aspects to the world. The, the word consciousness is used in many senses. And so we have to like, first of all, clarify what these senses are. And in this talk, I was only talking about one aspect, which is sort of the attentive consciousness, right? Uh, there are other meanings of the word consciousness. When you referred to souls, um, um, there is the, uh, the notion of self-consciousness, I think, which is fairly easy if you have an agent uh, in the world. That it has to know about itself and its role in the environment and its goals and things like this. And then there is the, the qualia, which is maybe, maybe related to souls or maybe not, uh, which has to do with the subjective perception, which I think is a, is a, is a non-issue because uh, when you use things like deep learning where you learn the internal representations, of course, each agent is going to have their own perception, their own representation. We, none of us has exactly the same representations. And so, so we will interpret the color red in different ways, and it may be associated with our good or bad experiences in the past. Now, for Searle's uh, Chinese room, I don't buy his argument at all, right? I mean, according to his argument, essentially, you wouldn't be conscious either, because what is your brain? It's just a collection of little agents, neurons, which interact with each other, and each following a simple rules, set of rules. Yes, it is. Well, yes, yes, yes follow up, just yes, close it down. So you think, I mean, that uh, the distinction between experience and consciousness is not an issue, right? And, but uh, what I mean, I mean, if you put it in more, more terms, I mean, the strong uh, problem consciousness, I mean, uh, do you mean also that it's not an issue as well? That's right. I think we, we can eventually in the future build conscious machines. Absolutely. Now, whether we want to do it is another question. Yes, uh, a pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Leobardo Morales from IBM. And in a conference of uh, the next equation of AI, you mentioned uh, the human is very good in unsupervised learning, no? Then, yes, that's right. Uh, um, how do you can explain with a little example how we can advance in that, in that way with the machines? Right. So in fact, a lot of my talk was about this because it was about learning good representations that capture how the world works, which is, I think, really what unsupervised learning should be about. Um, and in addition, the classical unsupervised learning was only focusing on capturing the joint distribution, and I've been saying we, unsupervised learning need also to encompass capturing causal relationships. Uh, so. Yeah, we have a lot of work to do, and maybe it's going to take many decades before we solve these problems. We have to be patient. This is what basic research is about. Hey. Yes. <laughs> so I was wondering about this idea of this higher level representation right. that you call the consciousness. Uh, and in terms of if you are thinking of like changing representation when you hold to higher levels, 
So maybe if you go to a higher level, you go more to, to a logical representation, and then you do other types of reasoning. Yeah. And I imagine that's what we do, but <laughs> what do you think? Well, so I don't think that um, uh, human brains are very good at logic. Uh, so we do a little bit of it. We're able to do like a few steps of logic. Um, and so we, we have mechanisms that allow us to, um, to do things that are logic-like, but are uh, weaker in some way, but also more powerful in other ways. So where it's more powerful is that our reasoning steps can be anchored in a very, very rich um, understanding of how the underlying world works, right? So um, that's what common sense knowledge is about. Like I can say a few words in a sentence and it's not just the logic here that relates those things. There's also underlying understanding of uh, you know, rich relationships between the, the, the things in the world that may be relevant to really interpret that sentence. So yeah, human reasoning I think has some flavors of logical reasoning, but it's also different because of its grounding in uh, system one. Uh, yeah. uh, what kind of policies could reduce the gap between countries, uh, uh, companies, and, and people related with uh, machine learning? Right. It's not just related to machine learning, I think. Okay. Yeah. Are... So, AI. so you're asking for like, um, basically, how do we get to world government, right? I mean, that's, that's like the natural place we'll eventually have to go to some form of global coordination. We're trying to do it already step by step by having international agreements and, and things like this. But organizations like the UN currently don't have enough teeth. They don't have enough power. And so we, we don't manage to um, solve problems because right now it requires essentially consensus, like, uh, or at least consensus of all the rich countries. And so that's not going to work. That's uh, one of the reasons why fighting climate change is not working right now at the international level. And it's one of the reasons why the problem with lethal autonomous weapons is, is not progressing because it's enough that one country, uh, like the US for example, says, I don't want to you know, sign a treaty like this, and nothing moves. So, so we need a, a more powerful global order, which still respects, you know, um, local issues and, and, and sovereignty, but um, um, there's a, I think the general principle should be everything that can be, all the decisions that influence mostly what's going on locally should be taken locally, and all the decisions that influence what's going on elsewhere have to be token, taken at a higher level. Right? And there are so many things right now, like the environment, and uh, handling like inequity between countries and all these things, which can only be handled at the level of the whole planet. So then how do we get there? Well, so I have an idea. Uh, <laughs> the idea is to create a club, right? So in a way the UN was, well, not the UN, the EU was moving in the right direction. Now I'm not sure anymore. Um, so let's say you had a club of countries which say, we're gonna link together our commercial, uh, like free trade agreements with our political agreements about things like how do we handle environment and, 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 and fiscal and all these things that need to be agreed upon in order we get, otherwise we get into a tragedy of the commons. So, so there might be an initial group of country which agree with something like this and basically tell the other countries, if you want to be part of our club, uh, you have to accept the rules of the club and you can then, you know, as a member of it, you will be voting for the same things in a democratic way. And if you're not part of the club, then in the next 10 years, we're going to be gradually increasing tariffs. So you won't be able to make business with us at some point. So in this way, you create a, a, a sort of a, a game in which the incentive of other countries is to just join the club. Okay, uh, so I uh, also always include in my talks a slide about Big Brother. Yes. Uh, but when people ask me, so what to do? 
I don't know do. what to say. Uh, you have a slide? Uh, you have um, to first like have people be realize that it's an issue. That's the first step. Yes. Uh, but uh, you have a slide about research that we should not that's do. That's right, that's right. The bad thing is that the bad guys will do it and you will not. And then uh, we uh, will be just in disadvantage because they will do it secretly. Yeah, it's exactly the same issue that I was talking about five minutes uh -huh. ago in the last, for the last uh, question. That the only way around these uh, tragedy of the commons issues is to agree on collective rules. Right? That's, why gov that's why we have governments. Right? So if we say, uh, well, we, we make a, a treaty that uh, just like we, we, we have been banning chemical weapons, we can ban uh, lethal autonomous weapons. Right? It, 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 that's the only solution. Looks like uh, artificial intelligence is much more difficult to control than nuclear development or, or uh, chemical weapons. Uh, bad guys can do it secretly without the governments noticing it. If we, uh, governments and good countries, will not have this technology, but they will, will have it. Uh, well, it's not so clear. So, um, you're right. So, there could be terrorists or like uh, rogue organizations which secretly do bad things. Um, but um, if, you know, so the rest can also be active, acting defensively and preventively, right? Um, so we can use AI, for example, to design weapons to kill killer robots. <laughs> but but, but the, the most important thing is to create an international um, consensus in the populations uh, that these, some of these behaviors are immoral and uh, are not acceptable. And then um, most people won't be willing to do this kind of work. Um. At least that's one hope. I mean, do you have a better solution? Um, hi, my name is Jan Avila from ITAM. Thanks for your talk. Um, my question relates to people like AI community, scientists, researchers. Yeah. What are the specific responsibilities they should assume, the specific actions they should do in order to make sure that AI is going to be used for social good and avoid the concerns you were talking about? Right. So I would say the first thing is to get educated about these questions. So for example, I think that all students in uh, computer science should have mandatory course in ethics. In fact, similar to what engineers uh, have to do, but, but more oriented towards how AI and computer science could be misused. So that's the first thing, like understand the issues and uh, you know, uh, understand the citizen point of view so that um, you can then start thinking um, and reasoning about, well, what is it am I doing? How is it gonna be used? What might be the impact, right? So that's the first thing. and then. That's the individual level. And then, then we need organizations who are gonna be watchdogs. We need governments, we need uh, civil society to try to monitor what is going on and, and uh, potentially create rules that, social norms, uh, to minimize the, the, the misuse of technology. Um, yeah, that's, that's it, very easy. Thank you. All right, thank you very much everyone. Let's thank again, once again. Please.